so let's just go around the table real quickly. Who do you think are the top seeds going into the tournament? Who are the three that you really like? And give me one sleeper who you think may just come out of nowhere. I really think, you know, we talked about it before, Syracuse, Kansas, and um, well, Duke, I think, is kind of, to me, as, on the outside as far as the number one seeds. Uh, I would leave it to, to Kansas, Kentucky, and Syracuse. And, you know, a team I think to look out for, you got to look in the Big East because the Big East always performs well in the, in, in the big dance. And, you know, a team like Marquette or, or Notre Dame, if they start playing their best game, they could easily make it to the Final Four. I mean, I really, with, with Herring Goody back now, if he plays well and the team plays well around him, something that really hasn't happened a lot this year, but if it, if it happens, if they gel, I think they could be a really dangerous team. Um, I'm going to have to agree with you on those three best teams. It has to be Syracuse, Kentucky, and Kansas. And as far as the Big East goes, I think any Big East team can make a run in this tournament. When you look at Louisville, Marquette, and also Notre Dame. But for my sleeper, it's going to be Ohio State. They might get a number one seed, probably looking at a two seed. But when you look at the player of the year in Evan Turner and the way that Thad Mata has done a tr tremendous job coaching this team, I think Ohio State's going to make a serious run to the Final Four. So you like Ohio State, a lot of that built around Evan Turner. How important do you think it is to have that one guy that you could just ride the back of that, you know, proverbial Danny Manning story where he just ride, can just ride him all the way to the championship? Obviously, Ohio State could do that with Turner, but how important do you think that is just in an overall sense of the tournament? Oh, unbelievable. I mean, you guys watch Kentucky. If you watch Kentucky, the way John Wall takes over games the last five minutes, that's what you need to have happen in the NCAA tournaments. What Carmelo Anthony did at Syracuse. It's what Okafor did at Connecticut. It's what, heck, even Joe Kim Noah at Florida. He's making blocks. He's making plays. That would be the difference between maybe just getting to a Final Four or getting to a national championship. You need that star player. I think John Wall, although Evan Turner, I agree. Best player in the country, best national player of the year, best player in the country is John Wall. All right. So it, well, not three only, favorites in your sleeper. Not only star players, but let's talk about guys that have been there before, and that's my sleeper. I'll get to that in a moment. But, again, you can't really argue with the locks. Of course, we know Syracuse is going to be there. Mm -hmm. Kentucky as well, and Kansas, they've done the body of work all season long. That is indicative of, of a number one seed. I'm kind of torn, and I really want to give that last one to the Big East. I just think that this league prepares you like no other would, especially on a year where, again, the national scene is just kind of down. There's not really a lot of schools. I'm sorry, you can throw away the Pac-10. Get rid of it. Get rid of the SEC this year. They're not really going to contend in this tournament unless something really wacky happens. How about Villanova? And, again, I mentioned Jay Wright before. I think the coaching job is there. Not only having the guy who can really just propel the team, put all the weight on his back and just carry it, but what about Scotty Reynolds, who's been there before? He's made the layup that has gotten them to that late stage of the tournament before. I really think that they might have it going one more time. The one problem with Villanova, though, they do happen to fall in these lulls at times. It almost happened against Seton Hall, that game at the Pavilion on, on February 2nd. It's just that kind of notion that they need to have their focus there. I think that they will because once they're back on the big stage, mm -hmm. I think Scotty Reynolds and his team will be ready to rock and roll. They could be going back, and what a testament that would be, especially to the Big East. In terms of my three best teams in the country, I think Kansas, Kentucky, and Syracuse. Syracuse. Yes. <laughs> you know what? I hate to sound like a homer, but when you have that 2-3 zone and you have veteran leadership, they, they deserve to be mentioned as a top three team. Mm -hmm. My sleeper, a team that was in a national championship game last year, Michigan State Spartans. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about a tournament team? Tom Izzo, one of the best tournament coaches there is in college basketball, would not be shocked if they got to the Final Four. Another team to look out for, Tennessee and Bruce Pearl. Beat the two top teams this year, beat Kansas and Kentucky. That's a team to watch out for as well. So wrapping up this year, let's take a look to next season. Seton Hall, we're not even sure which players are coming back or what the situation is there, but obviously with Syracuse and Jim Beheim and Dixon in Pittsburgh, give me a few thoughts on next season's teams. You know, I'll be honest with you. Syracuse is going to be losing some big-time players off this team. They're losing a Wesley Johnson, who I can almost guarantee you will go declare for the NBA draft lottery. Losing a four-year player in Andy Rounds. Losing a four-year center in Lorenzo Nawaku. So you'd say, oh, Syracuse is in some trouble. And don't worry about it. They'll be fine. They'll get a big center in Mello. This guy, Fad Mello, coming from Brazil, is going to be an outstanding center. One of the great big men for Syracuse coming in the future. I think they got some good recruits coming in. Now, are they going to be as good as they were here in 2009, 2010? Probably not. But I expect them to contend once again for the NCAA tournament. For Seton Hall, it's very tough to look ahead. You have the trio of transfers that came in, and Keon Lawrence, Herb Pope, and Jeff Robinson not really performing this year and getting this team to the next level. I hate to push off the expectations because I'm not one to do that to say, well, we do and didn't do it that this year, but next year is really the year that we're going to get it done and make the NCAA tournament. The fact of the matter is you're losing Eugene Harvey. I think slotting in very nicely will be the junior guard, Jordan Theodore, current sure. sophomore, mm -hmm. will become a junior, the kid out of Patterson Catholic. He's really ready to be a leader. Showed it this year. More than Harvey at times, which is pretty remarkable for the sophomore-senior combination looking at Theodore and Harvey respectively. But the recruiting class is not really much to talk about for Seton Hall. That's a problem. A recent New York Times article about Bobby Gonzalez said that none of these kids have actually academically qualified. Fuquan Edwin out of Patterson Catholic as well was the one who seemed like he was coming in and could have been a bit of a lot to start to get some significant minutes. Look, 
it gets really dicey if Seton Hall does not make the NCAA tournament this year, or next year, excuse me, because of what they did this year, more than likely going to the NIT. And it's very, very tough. Bobby Gonzalez may have the contract extension, but the fans and the support of the program could really flip if they don't make some noise next year and actually get to the top eight of the Big East. We mentioned how hard it was before. Seton Hall next year really becomes do or die because of the pressure and not getting it done in this past season. How much in college basketball is actually the players versus the coaches? We're talking about young guys here. We're talking about some guys that are 18, 19 years old. We're talking more about coaches needing to get more production and performance out of these guys, or are we laying the blame all on the players? I think it's definitely a little bit of both. You see, I, when you get to college, some players need to really change their game. Dante Taylor in high school was a center, and he's not really playing that as much now in, in college. He's at, Dixon actually has some criticism from his high school coach on that this year. Mm -hmm. So players need to evolve a little bit. So it's on a little bit of both, the coach to show them how to evolve and the player to actually step it up and make the performance. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with that statement. I think it's a combination of both because you got to have talent, but at the end of the day, these coaches got to try and take their players to the next level. And you look at two guys on Syracuse. They're in their third year and their fourth year. Number one, Andy Rounds. Now a fourth-year player, got that fifth year of eligibility because he tore his ACL after his sophomore year, really developed his game getting to the bucket, really developed you know, physically, put on about 20 pounds of muscle. The kid was a real scrawny kid coming into Syracuse. Now you look at him, he's not as scrawny. He's got some muscle on him. Another guy, Rick Jackson was absolutely abysmal his freshman year, worked with assistant coach Bernie Fine, the big man extraordinaire, worked with Derek Coleman, worked with some of those great Syracuse big guys. Rick Jackson has become a very good low post scorer for Syracuse. That's where a coach has got to take his player, mm -hmm. what he had, and try and develop it. Now, some of it's on the player, but some of it's got to be credited to the coaching staff, no doubt about it. All right, let's go around real quickly. Give me your top moment from this year in the entire Big East play. Wow, top moment. I mean, there's been so many, but I got to say, being on hand, Syracuse Villanova, biggest on-campus crowd in the history of college basketball. And for Syracuse, who had a very good year all year, had met a lot of trouble with Villanova. For them to go out there and beat Villanova by 18 points showed me how elite this team can be and how they are a legit national championship contender because I didn't believe it until I saw it against Villanova. That's my moment. That's surprising my moment. that his favorite moment was a Syracuse moment. Let's go <laughs> around surprised. the table. I'll have to do my best to also stay and support my home university, but I would say the last minute of regulation, Seton Hall, West Virginia. You're talking mm -hmm. a game on December 26th, national televised game, CBS, the only college basketball game on the entire schedule for the country. And Seton Hall trailing by 10 with about 57 seconds left, scores 10 points and forces overtime. Granted, they did not win. Who knows? That could have changed what we'd be talking about with mm -hmm. Seton Hall here, but the bottom line remains what a testament to the Big East and for schools at the bottom half. We talked about the whole season, whether it was USF upsetting Georgetown, maybe it was Louisville over Syracuse, sorry to bring that up once again, but at the end of the year, the fact of the matter is this league is so competitive and people were compelled because the bottom schools could always come back and beat the top schools. I think it gave a lot of people confidence in Seton Hall, made them interesting to watch in January and February, but to me, broadcasting that game for WSU, what a thrill just to see a team rattle right. off 10 points in 57 seconds and force an overtime. It's unbelievable. So let's probably keep with the trend here. Two Pittsburgh guys, your favorite moments are probably Pittsburgh related. Yeah, they are. I'm going to stay with that. And uh, I want to say the win over Syracuse because that really turned the year upside down for Pitt. No one ever thought they were going to win that game. But I'm going to go with the triple overtime win against West Virginia, which was just absolutely phenomenal. Great a great game, game great rivalry. And they came out, and, you know, they had a lot of con contributions from the bench in that game. And no one really thought after the first overtime, some of their guys started fouling out, and they stuck with it. And they played with a lot of heart that game and won that one in three overtimes. But three. I have to agree with you. I would say it's the triple overtime game. I was actually broadcasting that game, and just to see Pittsburgh come back, there's no way they should have won that game. They were down by six points with 30 seconds left in regulation against West Virginia. They came back to force overtime, and then Trayvon Woodall really stepped up in that game as, as a freshman point guard. He had a tremendous game, and Pitt won it in three overtimes at the Peterson Event Center. All right. The radio and personality voices from Pittsburgh, Seton Hall, and Syracuse. Thanks for joining us. March Madness is here. This has been The 60 on LockerBlogger.com. I'm Mike Baco.